I will, yeah, get to talk about John 9. Here we go. Holy Father, we just come before you tonight, and God, we just praise you. We, we praise you for the opportunity to just get to talk about your word, get to talk about your son, and get to just spend this time in community. Thank you for just the opportunity that we get to be here and meet and be together. Lord, would you just please be with me? Would you um, make my words be understandable and that you'd help me enunciate and slow down and that um, it would just be glorifying to you, Lord, and that they would be your words. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we are going to look at the sixth miracle of Jesus tonight. Um, that John has included in his gospel. This isn't like the sixth miracle that Jesus really did. We don't know how many miracles Jesus did. We're just assuming he like walked around and he did a lot of things. So um, I thought it'd kind of be helpful to reflect and compare to some of the miracles that we've studied up to this point. And so one of the major emphases in John 9 was that this miracle happened on the Sabbath. Um, and this is same as the healing of the paralytic. Um, and another connection to this same miracle, um, but it's kind of also somewhat different, is that the blind man, he does eventually embrace Jesus and believe in him. While we don't see that with the man who was paralyzed, we don't know um, if his heart actually changed to follow Jesus. And um, like the wedding party at Cana, um, the nobleman's son, the paralytic, and the blind man, and the Samaritan woman, um, well, She's not really, sorry, she's not a miracle, excuse me, sorry. Um, but they're not named, so we don't know their name. That's one thing that I think um, is kind of interesting. Um, also, both the paralytic and the blind man miracles, they occurred in Jerusalem. And I think that's kind of interesting because we know that in those moments that Jesus is confronting the Pharisees on kind of like their home turf. And because we know the ending of our story, that eventually that's leading Jesus to the cross and to his crucifixion. And so after those three miracles in Jerusalem, there's each like a lengthy discourse. And so we've looked at a miracle and then a discourse. And so we're looking at a miracle tonight. When we come back in the new year, we'll look at another um, discourse. And so there was a couple firsts, though, in this miracle that are different than the other five that we looked at. And so this is the first miracle that's initiated by a question of the disciples. Um, it's not the first miracle that the disciples have been in front of. This is actually the fifth. Um, they've been around most of them. And it kind of suggests that maybe the disciples are starting to realize, like, Jesus is son, God, son, ooh, that's bad, God's son. Um, and this is also the first miracle that Jesus touches, physically touches someone. And um, they gain sight. And so if you didn't know. I didn't know. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting because in Exodus, Psalm, and multiple times in Isaiah, it's cited that the healing of a blind person is a divine act, um, a divine act of the Messiah. And so here are two of those verses that really stood out to me. And Isaiah 35, 5 says, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. In Psalm 146, 8 says, The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. This healing represented the claim that Jesus is God. Also, we just read John 8, where Jesus boldly claims that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus took a man confined to darkness and healed him to see the light. This miracle screams to those with Old Testament knowledge that he, ha the Messiah, has come. And it'd be really easy for me to sit here and to condemn the Pharisees and the blind man's neighbors and even the blind man's parents. But that's not why we're here. You don't want to hear me do that. So we're actually going to look at John 9 through the blind man, what he was feeling, what his perspective is, and kind of what his thoughts and I have not experienced this, nor I'm going to pretend that I have, but I want us to put ourselves in his shoes just a little bit. I think it helps us understand the story and understand the impact that Jesus made. Um, so think about it. What's the worst medical experience that you've ever had? For me, it might happen about two years ago, which I feel like it happened like yesterday, so it's kind of crazy. Um, but I had my first run in with something called vertigo. If you've never experienced vertigo, this happens when the crystals in your ears, yes, you have ear crystals um, that help with balance, um, they get out of balance and create dizzy, dizziness, which usually leads to nausea. Um, but see the difference between my run-in with vertigo and the blind man is that the blind man had been blind since birth. 
I can't imagine being dizzy for my whole life and never knowing anything different. And that's where we encounter this man blind. We can assume begging on the streets of Jerusalem. This was his norm. It seems that he lived in this area and he had his spot. It happened that Jesus came by him and the disciples questioned, why was he blind? And they asked, who sent? Jesus' response shows that the glory of God would shine through this man. The temple lights had been burned out from the festival of the tabernacles, but Jesus still is the light of the world shining brightly. The man probably was confused. All he could hear was the debate about whose sin caused his blindness. I would imagine there was some shame that the man felt. Why were they talking about him? But then hearing Jesus say that it was no one's sin but that. This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Then the next thing that the man knew, he felt Jesus put something on his eyes. He probably has no clue. He's probably like, why is this person touching me? And Jesus told him to go wash at the pool. And the blind man, he immediately went and washed. He did not know what this man Jesus looked like, but he did know that he was healed. He could see again. At this point, the once blind man had not made contact with Jesus with his sight, but he knew the great work that had been done. He ran to share the news with his neighbors, but they did not recognize him. He couldn't be the blind beggar, could he? The neighbors questioned him multiple times. How was he healed? Where is the man who did this? The man only knew Jesus' name, and we see that it's inside of who Jesus is. It's just a really small seed, um, and we see it slowly grow as it becomes a faith. When is suffering in your life provided an opportunity for God's work and glory? Was this moment similar to the blind? Was your moment similar to the blind man? Was it the beginning of your faith? Spiritual sight focuses us to see Jesus for who he is because Jesus sees us, he comes to us, and has the power to open blind eyes. Jesus healed this blind man on the Sabbath and provided him with physical sight that would eventually lead to spiritual sight. When I think about my encounter with vertigo, my ear crystals were corrected by a lovely physical therapist. She kindly led me to learn about what was wrong with my body and helped me regain my strength. She guided me to understand how I can heal and proactively get ahead of a vertigo attack. How does Jesus do the same for us? When you are struggling, where does God's glo glory show up? For me, God's glory showed up when I let go of my need to be in control and heal my way, and instead took time to slowly heal and listen to God's call as he perfectly provided every step of my journey. The trust of the blind man to go immediately to the pool and rinse the mud off his eyes is astounding. It took me three days in bed with the world spending to finally start asking for help. The faith that the blind man shows is incredible, and we see it grow even more despite the questioning from his neighbors and now the Pharisees. The man's neighbors, they're not quite on board with his answers, and they think he's kind of probably crazy. So they take him to the Pharisees because that's what you did in those days. And I can only imagine that the man, he can just now see everything. So can you imagine if he's like, whoa, look at that, guys. Look at this. Oh, the dirt is this color. Like, he's just like probably like beyond overstimulated at this point. And he's probably so enthralled that when he looks at his hands and they just grab him and take him to the Pharisees, he doesn't even think about it. He's probably just like in awe. But the Pharisees, they did not care. And they're, they didn't want to believe. They would not believe that Jesus would give sight to this man born blind and that it would be possible. They didn't want to believe, so they found excuses to not believe in the goodness and greatness of Jesus' miracle. And instead of celebrating with this once blind man, they took out their angry rejection of Jesus' Jesus's identity on this man whose physical eyes had been opened. The tension is not the healing, but the action on the Sabbath. The Pharisees could not see past this minor detail of Jesus' greater miracle. So even though the man detailed what had happened, the Pharisees, they did not listen. I imagine the man is starting to get a little annoyed at this point. Both his neighbors and now the Pharisees, they don't believe him that Jesus had healed him. Why did these people hate this man so much? He only thought that he was a prophet. What harm was that? and they were wasting his time using his new found sight. And then the Pharisees have to make it worse, and they go get the man's parents. The man is probably horrified that his parents have arrived, but also, don't you think he's kind of intrigued? 
he sees what they look like now. He knows what they sound like. And he's able to be like, oh, that's why you stink, dad. Like, you never shit like they. Like, they know. It's great. The man knew his parents. And he knew that they would just follow what the Pharisees wanted. They were rule followers. His parents just wanted to be included and not left out of the crowd. Why were they not overjoyed that he could finally see just like them? It seems that his parents were scared. They had heard of Jews being excommunicated if they followed Jesus. They did not want that to happen. So instead, his parents just put the ball back in the man's court, telling the Pharisees, ask him, he is of age. So a second time, the Pharisees summoned the man to question him. And the same conversation ensues. The Pharisees claim that Jesus is a liar and a sinner, and the once blind man continued to praise God for his provision, though he still doesn't know who Jesus is. But then the story, it kind of reaches a climax. I feel like the blind man is done with these Pharisees. And I would assume that he's pretty tired of being questioned and condemned, and the Pharisees, they are just coming at him. And so he gets an inner surge of confidence. And kind of almost just seems like that the Holy Spirit has come in him. The words that he says are ones that we wouldn't think that he would know. And so it says, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. It's kind of like, like a mic drop moment almost. Um, even though the man's parents fear the religious leaders, this man did not. He challenged the Pharisees and laid out facts to prove that the only answer to who Jesus is, is that he is God. The man bested the Pharisees and humiliated by his words, they did the only thing that they had control of. They threw him out of the synagogue and limited his influence on others. These Pharisees were blinded by self-righteous sin and refused to see the goodness of Jesus Christ. They believed that Jesus was too good to be true. But the once blind man knew there was no bounds to Jesus' goodness. This caused division among the leaders and the members of the Jewish faith. The Pharisees handled it by kicking him out of the synagogue. His parents chose not to speak to him, and his neighbors couldn't figure it out, so instead they questioned him. Each of these groups of people rejected Jesus' miracle. To reject Jesus and his truth is to choose spiritual blindness. When we choose to not see the goodness that Jesus brings and the salvation that he provides, we choose to live in darkness. Has your commitment to Christ caused division or disagreement in your relationships? Personally, my commitment to Christ hasn't caused any like drastic or over the top or crazy social media things that you would see, um, but it has caused the divisions between my family and friends. Um, the way that Connor and I choose to live our life centered around Christ and being in a Christian community has caused friendships to change and family members to kind of sometimes doubt our decisions. The changes have been good, but at times they've been hard. As a fear of missing out person, I have felt left out when our life has looked different from others or felt not included because we are considered Jesus freaks. But the joy, contentment, and internal peace that I found through a life that reflects the goodness of Christ is way better than I could ever imagine. And when that FOMO giant sneaks back into my brain and tries to take control, I have to take a moment. I have to re-identify my worth in the true king of my life and remember that my life's goal is to bear fruit that honors the king. Because as we see the once blind man do, it's never wrong to stand up for Jesus. Maybe your experience have been different than mine. Maybe you have or are experiencing division and disagreements in morals or how you live your life, or maybe just a def general perspective of the world because of your faith. What is keeping you rooted in Jesus as you weather these difficult times? This verse from Colossians has been a reminder to me in times of conflict. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. As the once blind man was kicked out of the synagogue and humiliated, Jesus finds him. Whatever negative consequences you experience for confessing Christ are not the last words. He knows what you've been through and Jesus was aware of the blind man's circumstances. He tracks him down. 
Now remember, the once blind man has never seen Jesus' face, so he doesn't recognize him. He's probably like, who is this guy coming up and talking to me? I don't know him, which he doesn't really know anyone, so, you know, it works. Knowing this, the blind man's response makes more sense. He wanted to believe in Jesus, but he didn't know who he was. Can you imagine the man's surprise when the Son of Man was before him? In his life-changing encounter with his Lord, the man blind was given a new physical sight that then led to spiritual sight. Jesus offers this to all, new sight, new life, and new purpose for his glory. Having faith in Jesus and abiding in him bring satisfaction and joy beyond anything we could produce on our own. Jesus transforms our lives through faith. We see this through the response of the blind man. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped. The only being in the universe worthy of worship and praise is Jesus. And the blind man worshiped him. As Jesus normally does, he leaves us with a lesson amidst this amazing celebration. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. But wait, Jesus is the light of the world. Why is he condemning people? See, Jesus' primary purpose was redemption, but it brought about rejection and judgment. His primary focus was to save, but the fact is many rejected him and faced judgment of their choices. Because Jesus is the light, it necessitates a choice to follow him. As we know, not all made the same choice as the blind man. Because we all need Jesus to see, we're born spiritually blind with a desire to prove ourselves to others. We are blind to our unbelief and rebellion towards God. In our self-righteousness, we refuse to believe we need a savior or accept the simple truth that faith is a gift. This is what the Pharisees chose. But we know a better blessing. God's creation and evidence of his existence and love. God's greatest gift of love is his son, Jesus Christ. Those blinded by sin refuse Jesus as their savior. But faith in Jesus Christ is God's gift of salvation to us and leads us to worship. It takes away the sin that blinds us to the goodness of God. So what is standing in the way of you seeing God's great love for you, which is found in Jesus? Is your belief in Jesus leading you to worship? What does this worship look like in your life today? Jesus gives spiritual sight to those who put their faith in him. When I had vertigo, I was able to see the world as it is. My sight was very faulty, to say the least. And unless I put my faith in something else, someone else to help me see properly, I'd still be laying in my bed, unable to move without losing my stomach. I'm very grateful that I made the choice, realizing that I didn't have the answers, but that someone else did. So it is with spiritual matters. When we put our faith in Jesus, we can start to see the world as Jesus saw it, able to focus on what really matters and not get caught up in the world spending round and around. As we go into break from BSF, and some of you a break from your regular rhythm of work and life, will you keep searching? What will keep you searching for Jesus? Will you find him amidst the hustle and the bustle of the season? Maybe in the smiles of the family members and friends that you visit? My prayer for you is that you see him, that you know him, and that you make him known to all you meet. Let me pray for us. Dearly Father, you are, you are magnificent, Lord. You are amazing. And Father, we are astounded by your glory and your work and your willingness to be in the muck with us. Um, Father, we just praise you for all that you have done and all that you will done. Um, may our time together just be pleasing to you. And Lord, would you just bless and protect everyone in this room as they go out um, and celebrate Christmas and New Year's with their family and friends. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.